10. Many people will probably judge us callous as well as mad for thinking about the Northward Tunnel in the abyss so soon after our somber discovery. And I am not prepared to say that we would have immediately revived such thoughts but for a specific circumstance which broke in upon us and set up a whole new train of speculations. We replaced the tarpaulin over poor Gedney and we were standing in a kind of mute bewilderment when the sounds finally reached our consciousness. The first sounds we had heard since descending out of the open were the oak the mountain wind went whined faintly from its unearthly heights. Well known and mundane as though they were, the presence, their presence in this remote world of death was more unexpected and unnerving than any grotesque or fa fa fabulous tones could have possibly have been. Since they gave it a fresh upsetting to all of our notions of cosmic harmony. Had it been some trace of that bizarre musical piping over a wide range of which Blake's dissection report had led us to expect in all those others, and which, indeed, our overall fancies had been bringing into every wind howl we had heard since coming on the camp harbor, it would have had a kind of hellish congruity with the aeon dead region around us. A voice from other epics belongs in a graveyard of other epics. As it was, however, the noise shattered all our profoundly seated adjustments, all our tacit acceptance of the inner anarchic as a waste as utterly and irrevocably void of every vestige of normal life as the sterile disk of the moon. What we heard was not the fabulous note of any buried blasphemy of Elder Earth, from whose supernal toughness and age-denied solar polar sun had evoked a monstrous response. Instead, it was a thing so mockingly normal and so unerringly familiarized by our sea days off the Victoria land and our camp days at McMurdo Sound that we would shudder to think of it here, where such things ought not to be. To be brief, it was the raucous squawking of a penguin. The muffled sound floated from subglacial recesses nearly opposite to the corridor once we come. Regions manifestly in the direction of that other tunnel to the vast abyss. The presence of a living water bird in such a direction, in a world whose surface was one of age-long and uniform lifelessness, could lead to only one conclusion. Hence, our first thought was to verify the objective reality of the sound. It was indeed repeated and seemed at times to come from more than one throat. Seeking its source, we had entered an archway from which much debris had been cleared, resuming our trailblazing, and with an added safe paper supply taken with curious repugnance from one of the tarpaulin bundles in the sledges when we left daylight behind. As the glaciated floor gave place to a litter of detritus, We plainly discerned some curious dragging tracks, and once Danforth found a distinct print of some sort, whose description would only be too superfluous. The course indicated by the penguin cries was precisely what our map and compass prescribed as it approached the more north northerly tunnel mouth. And as we were glad to find that a bridgeless thoroughfare on the ground and basement levels seemed open. The tunnel, according to the chart, ought to start from the basement of a large pyramidal structure from which we seemed vaguely to recall our aerial survey as remarkably well preserved. 
Along our path, the single torch showed a customary profusion of carvings, but we did not pause to examine any of these. Suddenly, a bulky white shape loomed around up ahead of us. We flashed on the second torch. It is odd how wholly this new quest have turned our minds from our new earlier fears of what might near, lurk near. Those other ones having left their supplies in the Great Circular Place. Must have planned to return after their scouting trip toward or into the abyss, yet we had now discarded all caution concerning them, as completely as if they had never existed. This white waddling thing was fully six feet high, yet we seemed to realize at once that it was a, not one of those others. They were large and dark. Larger and dark. According to the sculptures, their motion over land surfaces was a swift, assured matter despite the queerness of their seaborne technical equipment. But to say that the, the white thing did not profoundly frighten us will be vain. We were indeed clutched for an instant by a primitive dread almost sharper than the worst of our reason fears regarding those others. Then came a flash of anticlimax as the white shape sidled into a, a lateral archway to our left to join two others of its kind, which had summoned in it in raucous tones. For it was only a penguin, albeit of a huge unknown species larger than the known of the great, greatest of the known king penguins and monstrous in its combined albinism. Albinism. And virtual eyelessness. When we had followed the thing into the archway and turned both our torches on the indifferent, unheeding group of three, we saw that they were all eyeless albinos, the same unknown and gigantic species. Their size reminded us of some of the archaic penguins depicted in the old one sculptures and did not take us long to conclude that they were descended from the same stock. Undoubtedly surviving through a retreat to some warmer inner region whose perpetual blackness had destroyed their pigmentation and atrophied their eyes to mere useless slits. That their present habitat was the vast abyss, we saw it was not for a moment to doubt it. To be doubted. And this evidence of the gulf's continued warmth and habitability filled us with the most curious and subtly perturbing fancies. We wondered what to what had caused these three birds to venture out of their usual domain. The state and silence of the great dead city made it clear that it had no time been a habitual seasonal rookery. Whilst the manifest indifference of the trio to our presence made it seem odd that any passing party of those others should have startled them. Was it possible that those others had taken some aggressive action or tried to increase their meat supply? We doubted whether the pungent odor of the which the dogs hated could cause an equal antipathy to those in these penguins. Since their ancestors obviously lived on excellent terms with the, <coughs> the old ones, an amicable relationship must have survived in this abyss below as long as any of the old ones remained. Regretting in a flare-up of an old spirit of pure science that we could not photograph these anomalous creatures, we shortly left them as they squawking and pushed on more towards the abyss, whose openness was now so positively proved to us, in whose exact direction occasional penguins' tracks made clear. Not long afterward, a steep descent into a low long, doorless, and peculiarly sculptureless corridor led us to believe that we were approaching the tunnel moth at last. We passed two more penguins and heard others immediately ahead. In the corridor, in a 
and in a prodigious open space which made us gasp involuntarily. A perfect inverted hemisphere, obviously deep underground. Fully 100 feet in diameter and 50 feet high with low archways opening all around parts of the circ circumference but one. And that one yawning cavernously with a black arched aperture which broke the symmetry of the vault to a height of nearly 15 feet. It was the entrance that created this. In the vast hemisphere, whose concave roof was impressively, though decadently carved into a likeness of the primordial celestial dome, a few albino penguins waddled, aliens there but indifferent and unseen. The black tunnel yawned indefinitely, off at a steeping descending grade. Its aperture adorned with grotesquely chiseled jams and lintels. From that cryptic mouth, we fancied a current of slightly warmer air, and perhaps even suspicion of <coughs> a vapor proceeded. And we wondered what living entities, other than penguins, the limitless void below, and the continuous honeycombing of the land and the Titan Mountains might conceal. We wondered too whether the trace of the mountaintop smoke at first suspected by Port Lake, as well as the odd haze we had ourselves perceived across the rampart, around the rampart crowned peak, might not be caused by the tortuous channeling rising of some such vapor from the unfathomed regions of Earth's core. Entering the tunnel, we saw that its outline was, at least at the start, about 15 feet each way. Sides, floor, and arched roof composed of the usual megalithic masonry. Its sides were sparsely decorated with cartouches and of unconventional design and a late decadent style. And all the construction and carving were marvelously well preserved. The floor was quite clear except for a slight detritus bearing outgoing penguin tracks and inward tracks of those others. The farther one advanced, the warmer it became so that we were soon unbuttoning in our heavy garments. We wondered whether, whether there were any in, in actually Igneous manifestations below, and whether the the waters of that same sunless sea were hot. After a short distance, the masonry gave place to solid rock, though the tunnel kept the same proportions and presented the same aspect of carved regularity. Occasionally, its varying grade became so steep that groves were cut in the floor. Several times we noted the mouths of small lateral galleries not recorded in our diagrams, none of them such as to complicate the problem of our return, and all of them welcome as possible refuges in case we met unwelcome entities on our way back from the abyss. The nameless scent of such things was very distinct. Doubtless, it was suicidally foolish to venture into that tunnel under the known circumstances, the known conditions. But the lure of the unplumbed is stronger than certain persons than most suspect. Indeed, it was just such a lure that brought us to this unearthly polar waste in the first place. We saw several penguins as we passed along and speculated on the distance we would have to traverse. The carvings had led us to expect a, a steep downhill walk of about a mile to, of the, to the abyss, but our, pres our previous wanderings had shown us that matters of scale were not wholly to be dependent upon. After about a quarter of a mile, that nameless scent became grossly accentuated, and we kept very careful track of the various lateral openings when we passed. There was no visible vapor at the mouth, as at the mouth. 
but this was doubtless to the, to the, to the lack of contrasting cooler air. The temperature was rapidly ascending, and we were not surprised to come upon a careless heap of materials, shudderingly familiar to us. It was composed of furs and tent cloth taken from the lake's camp, and we did not pause to study the bizarre forms into which the fabrics had been slashed.